Dr. Joe Davis is a historian, a retired school teacher. Uh, Joe has his PhD in English Literature from the University of Wollongong in 1992, focusing on the development of the pastoral novel and specifically D.H. Lawrence's Kangaroo. His first book was entitled D.H. Lawrence's Rural, published in 1989, and Joe is, is a world-renowned expert on D.H. Lawrence. Since then, he's also written three books on the history of Lake Illawarra, and his most recent book is A Feminist Study of Life-Saving Northern Illawarra. So a very eclectic collection there of um, interests from Joe, and today we're going to hear Joe talk about... Uh, what we'll do is Joe will talk, and there will be time for questions after as well. So, cartographic confusion in 18th century Illawarra. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much, Michael, and um, thank you to each and every one of you for coming along today. Thank you too to Michael for inviting me to talk. Um, he has made it rather difficult for me though because he told me, um, do you want to talk? And I foolishly said yes. And then he, uh, I said, look, well, I've just written this paper on uh, cartographic confusion in 18th century Lawara. And no one has ever tried to actually write about 18th century Lawara before because um, most people think there are no resources from which to write it. But I hope to perhaps either enlighten or alarm you today that there are many, many records that people are not aware of. But um, not only do I want to thank Michael, but I also um, want to uh, make a few remarks about his acumen in choosing me. Uh, me talking about explorers is, well, at the very least, ironic. I'm one of the least adventurous people in the universe. Um, the risk, I'm, I'm totally risk-averse. Actually, um, as um, dangerous as I'm willing to make life is to walk down that corridor towards the university archives, and that's about as uh, well. That's about as exciting as it is for me. And I look over there at that boat there, which um, I think it's fabulous. You've got that as part of the ex exhibition. But um, what was Governor Hunter thinking? Like, where was his occupational health and safety team? Um, why was there not someone doing a risk assessment on sending three individuals in that boat on an open sea? Admittedly, you know, it's a bit deceptive there. There was a makeshift sail stuck in the middle. But you imagine setting forth from Sydney Heads and heading this way and not knowing really where you were going or what you were doing. Like, I find it ludicrous that that was even attempted. But before I do that, um, what I want to do is, um, this little exhibition here is a real piece of connoisseurship. Now, connoiss connoisseurship is the most dodgy of art historical terms. Um, it's what academics use when they haven't got any evidence, but they say, well, I just think it's by that artist. But this is actually a really seriously um, fine work of connoisseurship. And um, that's largely due not only to the way it's been beautifully hung, like it's very hard to, to hang an exhibition in, a, in an attractive way, and Stephanie Drummond's done a great job doing that. But the works chosen there are, are sort of like my old friends. Um, I'd like you to look at that little one just there, that beautiful one there, it's supposedly of uh, Bass and Flinders doing their famous hair cutting scene. And um, it was done in 1926, and um, I found that piece of work um, being sold by a, a bookshop in Sydney called the Antique Bookshop. And not only was he selling the book, but inside was the print. And uh, I got very excited by that, but the print is actually awful. Like, that is an exceedingly bad piece of art. It is just shocking. Um, that person in the foreground doing the hair cutting is meant to be Matthew Flinders. It looks um, less like Matthew Flinders than I think that anyone would imagine. In the distance is George Bass, who in reality was this vast man. Like, how he even fitted into that boat is beyond me. But he was a seriously big boy. And so I've always been puzzled by that. But beautifully, this little exhibition just last week, I thought there must be a reason why that is so badly done. And I looked at the face of Matthew Flinders, and I'd like you at the end of this to go and look at the face of Matthew Flinders, because it's Percy Lindsay. He's done a self-portrait of himself as Matthew Flinders. And I thought, why on earth would you paint that person looking like that? But because he was just having fun and doing that. And that's why I started with that image just a second ago called Really and Truly. Because most people don't realise that um, 
Well, my study was in English literature, and that's basically about fiction. But there is just so much fiction in history. My favourite historian is the American historian, Will Durant, which most people will never have heard of. But he said, most history is guessing, and the rest is prejudice. <laughs> I, think, I think he's spot on the mark. And um, not only is that an extraordinary work, but no one had obviously thought to think why that is such a bad work. And I'm so happy I convinced the World War Gallery to buy that. They got it for $450, plus the textbook that it came out of. And that's why probably some of you will know that famous haircutting scene of Bass and Flinders, because I even copped a bit of that at school. I can remember a teacher getting up and telling me they came down and cut the hair of the Aborigines at Lake Illawarra. And it's only because Percy Lindsay whacked a, an image in his, his school textbook and uh, produced what, what to me is quite a laughable piece of art, but it's one of the great works of the Woolnell Gallery collection. And if you go to the back of the room, right in the corner, you can see a yellowish sort of image right down there. And that's the giant panorama of Illawarra. And um, everyone, even Michael and I, are publishing a book called The History of Wollongong, edited by Professor James Hagen, published by the University of Wollongong Press. But that was the cover, that image. But no one had thought to ask, who's it by? Um, when I looked it up, only, only about a month ago, uh, one catalogue entry said it's by someone called Wags. Um, presumably wags the dog from the wiggles or something like that. But um, I did some research and I've actually identified the person as being William Alfred Clarson and uh, would you believe it, just last night I found his jail mugshot and so I've actually got a photo and if anyone's interested, if you go to my um, academia page, just, just Google Joseph Davis Academia and I've written a full article on uh, the life of William Alfred Clarson and he was, a, he was a very good looking dude in this photo. And mug shots are usually awful, but somehow, being an artist, he convinced the person taking the camera to take this glamorous portrait of him. So it's, it's quite fabulous. Um, you may find his story quite interesting because it's seriously about sex. He, he remarkably married two women within eight days, which is quite an extraordinary thing. He was then put in jail for four years for bigamy. So um, a fascinating man, and, uh, but he had great trouble with women. But because I think he was so devastatingly good looking, you can sort of understand why that was the case. Um, I'm disappointed too that Michael didn't tell me what the program was about because um, I could have um, talked about Von Gerard. He's my great art hero. And uh, only just in the last few months I've discovered that that image on the uh, eastern side, the one of the trees at American Creek, I've actually found the name of the man whose farm that was on. Uh, the State Library had listed it as by a man called K-E-W-A-N, and I searched for decades trying to find this man in Illawarra and couldn't, but it turns out because they typed it in wrongly, his name is S-L-E-V-I-N, Sleeven. And so I was able to find his land title and everything. So I know exactly which property he was at. And the second image there of Lake Illawarra is looking down from the Berkeley Estate. Many of you will have been there and gazed down on that beautiful landscape. Well, there's a great sex story associated with Von Gerard and that too, because he was staying with the Jenkins family. And you know how I said um, how dangerous I think it is walking into those archives in there? Well, in those archives in the last few months, I found this shocking story. Um, there's a man called McCaffrey in there, and he's deeply interested in the sex lives of Illawarra cows. And he's compiled a list of every single cattle sale in Illawarra and the bleeding lines and... It's mind-bogglingly boring to read. But not only does he have an interest in the sex lives of the cows, he's got a deep interest in the sex lives of the early residents of the Illawarra. And there was a bit of a scandal. Von Gerard turned up and got to stay with the Jenkins family. And artists got to stay free of all these colonial properties because they did portraits for the family in exchange for the accommodation. So he got to do the beautiful view looking down at Lake Illawarra, but he got to do some portraits of the family. Now, when artists like to do portraits of young ladies, they prefer to do nude portraits of young ladies. And uh, he managed to convince one of the Jenkin daughters to take all her clothes off and start painting. Now, I don't know what else he was doing to one of the Jenkins daughters, but the family got rid of him very quickly. And I think that's why he had to do that portrait of American Creek from this very down-at-heel farmer called Mr. Sleeven, who was a bit of a desperado, actually, and had a, a very unfortunate life. But anyway... That's about all I want to say about Illawarra art, except for one thing. Um, I'm trained in English literature. I should have no interest in art whatsoever, but that's basically what I write about these days. Um, it's basically what people pay me to talk about as well. But 
Michael Organ's done something special. He found Elora's greatest artist. That artist is uh, in, engaged on a scientific exploration in Australia on a boat called the Navara. And his name is Joseph Selene. And Michael, in that lovely white cabinet there, has an image of an Aboriginal man called Tullumbar. And it is just fantastic. Like, you occasionally get portraits of Aborigines, but you don't get serious portraits like that. You can see every tribal marking, every tattoo. The man has glaucoma. Like, he's probably about 60 or 70. And yet, you look at his body. He is a seriously fine physical specimen. Still at 70, almost totally blind from glaucoma. You can see it in his eyes. But, um, I'm, I'm guessing it's one of the most homoerotic portraits of an Aborigine ever, ever done. And uh, I'd be deeply interested to find out a lot more about Mr. Selene. But Michael Orwin found that in Canada. And there it is hidden away. And sadly, recently at Sotheby's, a better landscape than any of the Von Garards came up by Selene. And we tried to get it for the Woolloomong Gallery, but it went for £220,000, which is a lot more than Australian money, so we missed out. So, if at the end anyone has any questions about these artworks, these are my old friends, most of these, and I, I'd love to tell you more about them. But I'm here today to talk about uh, early Illawarra. Now, um, I was delighted quite recently to watch that wonderful show on uh, Germaine Greer, Robert Hughes, um, Clive James on ABC TV. And I'd always, I've always loved Germaine. I've read every book, well, I think I've read every word of Germaine's. Uh, the Mad Woman's Underclothes is one of my favourite books by her that you've probably never heard. But um, She's just a fantastically exciting writer in there. But she said in that wonderful series of interviews that she spent most of her life inside libraries. You know, she's led an incredibly boring life because she's a researcher. She's an academic. She's actually trained in English literature too and never writes about it. I've never written a word about English literature because I... <laughs> Um, my expertise is pre-Shakespearean poetry from about 1580 to about 1595, and no one's ever asked me to talk about that. Um, but she's an expert on Shakespeare, actually, of all things. And that's why it's quite ironic for me to be talking about these people who came here to Illawarra before 1800. Um, Shakespeare, when he writes the word for travel, doesn't spell it as travel. He spells it as travail. Because the word travail and the word travel were synonymous in Shakespeare's day. Going anywhere was exceedingly unpleasant. It meant torture, it meant pain, it meant um, discomfort. And so that's why those two words are actually cognate, they're actually totally the same, and Shakespeare uses them interchangeably. And when you think about someone in 1796 getting in that boat, you get a good idea of what discomfort is all about. George Bass foolishly took his shirt off and swam to shore and left his shirt off. Matthew Flinders describes him as being one continuous blister that night. And he had to sit in a boat off the coast of our Illawarra coast, one continuous blister in a raging sea, and they could hear the waves breaking on rocks. They couldn't see a thing, because you can imagine a pitch black night. You can't arrange your voyage out of Sydney Harbour. You can leave with a full moon, but if you get blown off course, you see nothing at night. And for me, I, you know, as I say, I'm very risk averse. I'd be seriously worried about the fools who did the risk assessment on this voyage. It was just lunacy. Like, um, Tony Abbott often talks about a death cult, but this was clearly a death cult for these three people. They were being exceedingly reckless. Now, people think, and even um, Paul Brunton from the State Library thought that uh, the first people to enter Illawarra, white people, uh, were bats and swindlers. But uh, that's not the case. And, I want to talk about this cartographic confusion. Well, I'll just show you a few things. Um, that's dear sweet Percy, which you can go over and look at the image and see exactly what he looks like. Now, there's an interesting portrait of someone who did sail past our coast, and his name is Giacomo Cook. He was so famous, he was published all over. Why they chose Giacomo in this? I, I collect Italian prints, and so I love this one. He should be called Giacomo Cuoco, but uh, he's not. But um, I love that cute little image of him. Um, another thing there, that's actually a postcard that was issued about 1902 and it's celebrating George Bass. And what's marvellous about it is in the your top right hand corner is the very first depiction of a haircutting scene on Lake Illawarra. And look how beautifully sawn by a fabulously, um, I suppose, a steam powered uh, cutting instrument. 
It's had beautiful longings. Those Aborigines did very well to have that sort of technology in those days, and I think that's just a lovely image. And you do find the boat with the sail down in this corner, so you get a better idea of how they actually navigated this exceedingly dangerous craft. Now, there's the first evidence of European settlement in Illawarra. Now, it's a map, and everybody says it's Bass and Flinders' map. But it's not. It's done by the surveyor Charles Grimes. And most people have never heard of Charles Grimes. Um, that map that has been attributed to Bass and Flinders was actually, I believe, never cited by either of them. They were um, away, they were back in England. So this surveyor in New South Wales, Charles Grimes, he wasn't even the official surveyor. A man called Charles Alt was the official surveyor, but he was so sick that he made uh, Paul Mr. Grimes do all his work. And Grimes was a serious explorer. He went everywhere surveying. And if you know anything about early law or history after 1800, not before, um, you'll find that it's the surveyors who are the pioneer white explorers. Now, that map's got Hat Hill on there. Now, Cook, uh, Cook names that place, but he doesn't call it Hat Hill. He says it's cocked like a hat. And our big problem for a long while is there's two hills there, Mount Pure and Mount Clemble, which one is actually, they both look like hats to me, but most people have decided it is Mount, um, Mount Kembla. This is from a textbook published a few, well, 26 years before that one that had the um, delightful image of uh, the hair cutting scene at Lake Otawara. Um, it's a beautifully produced, it's been very expensive, it must have been for a very expensive private schools. But it had this lovely poem in it, and uh, being an English person, I love the scansion of this. Australia, you know, had been recently found. It was Flinders who first sailed the continent round. And that's how history was once taught in our school. It's still taught poorly, I think, but that's pretty bad that you have to memorise these silly, silly rhymes. And uh, then you find that is a 1900 image of the Illawarra coast. Now, I just love that. That's just, that's just so out there for 1900. That is, that is seriously good. And there you've got uh, you know, a lovely ship out to sea and you've got our native animals all there and our indigenous people. Yeah, that's just wonderful, isn't it? And as you can see, these books were produced in England. And my, great, uh, my great taste these days is for works of Illawarra painted by people who are never here. And, uh, I really find that quite exciting. Okay, well, to turn to explorers now. Um, this Charles Grimes, he does the map from Bass and Flinders. I presume, and I can't prove it, he came to Illawarra. Um, it's pretty silly to try and do a map, but as you can see, you can draw a, a landscape of Illawarra without uh, being there. I presume you can draw a map from someone else's details. But the fact that he calls it Hat Hill suggests that he's working on his own because he's not using Cook's words. Now, I showed you the lovely picture of Percy and that lovely one of Lieutenant James Cook. I never know whether to say Lieutenant or Lieutenant, but being a boy from the gutter and learning English as a second language at my high school, um, I'm not sure what is correct. But anyway, um, what I think is pretty interesting about this man is he's revered as the great navigator. Well, sadly, when he sailed up the Illawarra coast in 1770, he was having a very bad day. Now, you think, you're, you're probably up there, you know, probably regarded as the very, very best. You sail up the coast of New South Wales, you miss Jarvis Bay, you see Mount Dromedary down near the rumour, and you call it Cape Dromedary because you can't tell that there's an island in front of it called Montague Island. Um, you then make the ludicrous decision on the 28th of April, 1770, to try and land somewhere near Wununa Point. Now, I'm a surfboard rider, and when the surf's no good and it's totally flat, you head for Wununa Point, because for some reason it picks up the swell better than everywhere else. And yet, people tell me, and I, I think there must be some miscalculation here, I think no sense of a navigator would ever try to land at Winona Point. It is just too exposed, it's too ridiculous. They try it and they abandon it. Now, I um, because I come from an English literature background, I really have very little interest in history, and 
I had no interest in local history until I met Michael Morgan, and uh, I had... Uh, Don't blame <laughs> Oh, well, I, you're going to get a lot of blame in this talk, Michael, but anyway, um, not only that, he was... He, well, first, I can see he probably doesn't remember this. The first time I met him was in Wollongong City Reference Library. And he was just sitting there working, and he'd been doing it for days while I was researching um, the Soviet Civil War, which is another of my interests. And uh, I, I, I tend to like to talk to people to find out about them. And I think I went up to him and said, what are you doing, mate? And he was really cold and really prickly and said, oh, family history. And I thought, oh. And I said, What's, where's the family from? He said, well, no. And the two things I hated was local history and family history. And I thought, oh, no, who is it? He was very unfriendly, so I thought, oh, well, I won't talk to him again. But, um, and amazing, we grew up about a kilometre from each other, but I never met him. We went to the same university, I never met him at university either. But what's happened is because of that evil man there, my interests in the world have narrowed from the Soviet Civil War in 1922 down to Illawarra in the 18th century. And uh, Michael and I have become so-called um, generalist experts on the history of Illawarra, but um, I think I've actually broadened Michael's horizons because he's narrowed mine. Now, we've also got the ridiculous habit of um, finishing each other's books. Um, I didn't know him very well, but I'd come up with the idea of that South Coast Aborigines book, of collecting it all from white documents. And I'd collected about 100 documents, and it had taken me about two years. And I told him about it. And he turned up at my place about four weeks later, and he had about another 100 pages in four weeks. And I couldn't believe that he could have achieved that, but he was lucky. He was unemployed at the time, and I was working, so he had time to do stuff. And so I handed the project over to him, and he did an absolutely splendid job. Now, later, when Michael Alden was um, the local member of Parliament in the uh, House of Representatives for the Greens, um, he was offered to write, about a book, uh, write a book about Lake Illawarra. And he kindly handed that to me because uh, he was employed and uh, I was I was school teaching, so I was well, semi-employed, I guess. Okay, the first person who arrived here, strangely, has never been mentioned before. His name was Captain Thomas Melville. Uh, believe it or not, Herman Melville, Moby Dick, is a relation. And he arrives in 1892 and he sails up the coast and he goes and tells Governor Philip. I have never seen your whales in my entire life. And this bloke is a whaler. He spent his life off the coast of Brazil killing whales. He said, I saw more whales sailing up here than I have in the last five years off the coast of Brazil. So Philip says, money. And immediately <coughs> gives him permission to come down whaling. Now, his whaling expedition, he actually is very good. He gives his latitude, but whether his latitude is, uh, is sound or not, it would appear to be he found most whales off the coast of Colborough. But as he sailed, he couldn't, he killed them, but couldn't get them on his boat because of rough weather. But off the coast of Villarora, he managed to land quite a few whales. Now, when you're trying to whale in a small craft, it's exceedingly difficult, and you probably need to go on shore. There is no record of Captain Thomas Norman landing on shore, but um, I suspect he did, and I suspect he did for a very good reason. Um, in 1797, we have this fabulous story of the wreck of the Sydney Cove, and a few survivors walk all the way from down to Victoria, up the coast and stagger along. One of them writes a journal, and here I am reading the journal, and I'm so excited, and they get to the Shoalhaven River, and it's absolutely, I'm going, they're going to be in Illawarra soon, I'm going to read the first description of Illawarra by a white person, and he says, uh, the rest of the journey was much the same as before. <laughs> so I'm in tears thinking, how can I do this to me? But the really amazing thing is that later, the first documented record we've got is by a surveyor called George Evans in 1812. Now, George Evans is the son-in-law of Captain Thomas Melville. And what I've found is that all these early people who came here before 1800 are incestuously intrepid. They are all related or close friends. Um, the connections and the coincidences are absolutely extraordinary. Something that Paul Brutton didn't point out, and most people don't realise, is that when Bass and Flinders came down, there's two haircutting episodes. There's one that seems to be off about Red Point, and they mention an Aboriginal man called Dilba. Now, Bass claims that he couldn't understand, he, he, 
He could understand Durga, but he couldn't understand the language of the local Aborigines. Then you think, now how would Bass know anything about Aboriginal languages? But Bass is the first white person ever to arrive in Australia speaking Aboriginal, an Aboriginal language from the Sydney Cove area. And that's because he brings Ben along back to Australia. So he's got four and a half months of tuition every single day learning Ben Along's language. And Dilba was from Sydney Cove. And he could understand Dilba, but he couldn't understand our local people. And so what's absolutely extraordinary is you've got the first encounter down here recorded, but you've got the possibility that Bass can understand far more. Um, the Scottish martyr, Thomas Fish Palmer, describes uh, Bass as the most educated in native languages of anyone he's ever met. And it's precisely because he came out with Benelong. On the same ship as Matt Bass and Flinders came to Australia was, of course, Governor Hunter. So they were close mates. And Governor Hunter was not only interested in finding Bass Strait and seeing if they could reduce the voyage from England by three days by going through Bass Strait, but he was interested in money and whales and whale oil. And when you've got George Evans risking his life in 1812 by landing at Jervis Bay and trying to walk to Appen, as foolish as these blokes in the boat, just a ridiculous thing to be, he left a journal of it. And uh, fortunately, that journal's in the State Library. And I do have to return to Michael Morgan on this one too, because not only is there's this fabulous journal that we're sure is by George Evans, even though it doesn't have his name on it, um, Michael Morgan is the only person in the universe to find a Beagle journal. Like, if you'd been an academic at this university, he would have been appointed emeritus professor immediately. He found the Beagle Journal of Conrad Martins. Um, an extraordinary thing to find. It was stuck there in the Mitchell Library. They didn't know they had it. And Michael identified that, and they published his transcription of it. So what I'm trying to get across is that there's all this stuff out there that people have just not looked at. And a hell of a lot of it is actually in that, that archives down there. The reason I'm giving this talk is this man, McCaffrey, um, he was a lunatic, clearly. He shouldn't have been wasting his life doing all this history. But he, well, I guess he was on the autism spectrum somewhere. He just religiously wrote absolutely everything. And uh, he interviewed everyone by 1880, 1890. And these had memories that go back. And he actually claims that uh, the first white people came to Willowara in 1805. They landed cattle at Lake Illawarra, let them run free, and then came back and collected them. And he came up with a man called Nickel doing that in 1805. And I thought, this is just gossip. Like, McCaffrey can only be as good as his source. If his source is good, McCaffrey gets it right. If McCaffrey's source is wrong, he gets it wrong. So I did some research, and then I found out that uh, Nickel was very closely related to George Johnson, the rum rebel, who becomes Lieutenant Governor after overthrowing Bly. And then I got onto Bly, and you find out that Bly is connected to Giacomo Cook, they were together. And then you find that every single person who's mentioned in relation to Willowara is either married or a very close personal friend. And so what's happening is the charts in those days are disastrous. Um, Cook really messes up coming up the hard coast. Like, this great navigator just gets it all wrong. Even the latitude's all wrong. You can't rely on anything. Flinders nearly dies on the Great Barrier Reef because uh, uh, by that time, um, Cook is almost um, half a degree out, which could be as much as 70 miles. And so he's trapped inside the Barrier Reef because of Cook's bad charting. And Cook was being good in a sense. He'd made it all the way from England and kept these people alive. And I guess he was excited to be thinking, I'm going to land soon, and wanted to. But um, he, uh, I, my, my only explanation is that um, he, he's got a chronometer, but it's not the finest, it's not the best you can have. It's dodgy. And other people, Philip actually got a really fine chronometer and could do a lot better. But Flinders said, I just can't rely on Cook anymore. And so what I think we have in early Illawarra is this incredible possibility that there are all these people who are very connected. And although I told you I hate both history and family history and local history, the great tragedy for me is that boat terrifies me for a very good reason. My foolish ancestor, Peter Hughes, was a first fleeter and he was a seaman on the Sirius. 
So he knew Governor Hunter personally, he knew Bradley personally. Sadly, he sails, circumnavigates Tasmania with Bass and Flinders. Bass and Flinders laugh at him. I thought they were praising him. In, in Flinders' journal, he talks about the colonial master, Peter Hibbs. And I thought, how good is that? Like, here's two of the greatest navigators in the world calling my ancestor a colonial master. They were laughing at him. The colonial word is a bit of a, well, it's the cultural cringe. They're going, look at this pathetic creature. He's basically there as crowd control for the other convicts on the boat. But, uh, and so I, my, my illusions, my bubble was just totally shattered. But anyway, he not only spent all the time serving that way, he's great mates with bats. They climb on Mount Wellington at, um, at Hobart on um, New Year's Day, 1799. And uh, then he foolishly, this hips bloke, sails to, um, to Queensland in the next voyage of the Norfolk. Um, as I've explained to you, I'm a total wuss and totally risk adverse. This very foolish man called Bernard Cuthbertson did a reenactment of the voyage of the Norfolk, certainly navigating um, Tasman to celebrate the bicentenary. The idiot found out that I was related to Peter Hughes and wanted me to go on the boat. <laughs> and uh, I just said, you've got to be kidding, mate. There's no way I'm getting on something like that. <coughs> and the great, great pleasure for me was um, after they set through, it was a huge storm. And they got blown to um, New Zealand. <laughs> and, uh, and the reports think no radio contact, no nothing. I thought they'd all died. I thought, gee, I won on this one. But he is such a skilled seaman that somehow he deliberately turned off his radio contact and went with the winds and knew what he was doing and managed to get back and complete the second navigation. But I'm certainly glad I wasn't stuck in a tiny craft in Bass Strait in a serious storm. But anyway, not only that, because he came so early in my ancestor, um, he gets wrecked on Norfolk Island. And all these people who end up in Illawarra spend time on Norfolk Island. Bass and Flinders are on Norfolk Island. That's where they pick up this Peter Hibbs bloke and take him you know, on their, on their journeys. And uh, so the, I thought, well, that's the end. That's all I can know about early Illawarra. But sadly, the finale and the piece de resistance is this. I'm descended from a long line of sailors. I'm the only male in, well, since the first fleet who hasn't been a seaman. So um, something went wrong with the gene pool. Perhaps it's the Aboriginal bit in me that came out. I don't know. But uh, I'm staying on land. I love surfing, but I'm not going past the, where the waves are breaking. Anyway, um, this, this sail... Um, because my father was a sailor, I know that sailors are dangerous. They can be liars. My father used to lie all the time. But um, this Peter Hibbs claims to be the only person in Australia who came with Captain Cook. So he'd been here before Arthur Phillip. Now, about eight books, very serious academic books, have quoted him on that and said it's true. So I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. So I did some investigation. On no ship of Cook's is there the name Peter Hibbs. No way. However, um, they never ever record the names of the cabin boy. And in Poverty Bay in New Zealand, um, Giacomo Cook writes in his journal, I've just discovered Hicks Head Point. And I'm naming it after the young cabin boy Hicks. Now there's only one cabin boy, there's only one cabin boy, there's only one person in the ship called Hicks. And he is Zachary Hicks. And he's about 57. Now why would you call him young Mr. Hicks? Now, either you're being ironic, and because I'm into English, that's every possibility. But there's this slim, po slim possibility that one of my ancestors was one of the fools who tried to land round Wanoona in that reckless surf and nearly drowned. And then it gets a bit worse than that because um, not only does he claim that he was there with Cook, um, if that's when you come out with Arthur Philip, you're, you're the only one who's been here before. Now, I think of these people and I think of going in a boat like that and I think, what was going on? Why would you do it? And there's only one answer. It's money. Um, a very famous poet who once did a, a very brief stint at this university, the late John Ford, said, it's the stupid future you want to impress, not just those who will always be richer and less famous than yourself. No, sorry, less talented than yourself. So it's the stupid future you want to impress, not just those who will always be richer and less talented than yourself. And that's where this 18th century thing comes in. They had very odd ideas. It was an old world. First fleeters were still performing duels. You would you know, throw down your glove and challenge them to a duel and fight it out. Uh, there were these notions of honour 
And there were two sorts of people. There were Captain Melville, who knew how to make money. He was here to while. He was here to use exploration to make money. You had fools like Blass and Flinders, who did it for the fame, for the honour. They wanted to be great navigators. Those two boys from Lincolnshire, they grew up very close to each other, much like Michael Hooker and myself. Didn't know each other, but ended up as partners for a very, very difficult voyage. And what I think we need to consider is that um, why would you do it? Surveying the coast, doing as Matthew Flinders did, circumnavigating the whole continent, was an insane thing to do. It is so boring as well. He must have been on the autism spectrum too to be able to do that. Like every day, the same thing, measuring exactly. You know, a terrible life. The food, appalling. The conditions, appalling. The chance of death at any moment. Um, these people, to me, are just reckless fools. And I can't work out why they did it. The ones who did it for money, I can understand that. And poor, poor um, Bass and Flinders didn't realise they were being funded by the East India Company. The East India Company wanted that quicker route to Australia for trade. That's why the Sydney Cove got wrecked. You know, it was all about money. And if you know anything about early colonial New South Wales, it is, if you think corruption's alive today, well, we had it big time back then. You know? My wife is Italian and she says, you know, these, these people in early colonial Australia make the mafia look pathetic. You know, they, they really knew how to milk money. And the governors are in it. Hunters lined up with, um, with King, they conspire against Bly, even from England, even though those former governors aren't there. And the point I'd like to close on is this, is that what you've got is a, a very difficult situation in that um, this Bass and Flinders must have been very, very old people. Um, they seem to have ludicrous relationships with women. Like Flinders married a woman and then uh, wants to take her to Australia and dump her in Sydney while he sails around for three years. Fortunately, she said, well, the government wouldn't let her do it for one thing. But she says no to that. So he basically never saw his wife. He then gets exiled in Mauritius, doesn't see her again for eight years. Um, Bass was even stranger. Bass married um, the, the sister of Mr. Waterhouse. Now, Waterhouse was seriously into making money. He was a commissary. You know, money was everything. I don't think Bass even liked women. I suspect, and no one's ever said this before, but I'm pretty sure that the boy Martin uh, would have been in serious trouble with Bass in that boat because um, he, he, he married this woman solely for money. He married Miss Waterhouse just because, well, he tried this fabulous deal with Governor Hunter and all these other people to send a boat to Sydney and make lots of money from all the stuff they bought from England and settled at a vast profit. Um, unfortunately, when they got there, there was a glut on the market, so they lost all their money. He was absolutely desperate for money, so just marries Waterhouse's sister so he doesn't have to pay the debts back straight away and then immediately sails for Chile in a boat and is never seen again. Um, people say he got wrecked. I think it's a suicide. Like, it's this death cult again that these people have. He wants to escape his death. He wants to escape a woman he didn't want to marry and he sails off into the wild blue yonder. And so what I want to end with is the notion that in those archives there and in these archives all over Australia, there are lots of details, and the weird thing about Australian history is it's so totally unresearched. Um, Paul Brunton, who was here to open this fabulous exhibition just recently, um, he's had passed through his hands all the great documents of Australian history. But unfortunately, archivists and librarians have administrative tasks, and they don't get the chance to actually read them carefully. And if you read them carefully, you will find there is a stack of information that just no one has any idea is there. So, thank you.